Aloha, friends, and welcome back to this week's episode of The Embodied Healing Self. So I'm super excited to share another amazing guest with you this week. I know I always say that because I really do my research and my homework and invite people who have inspired me, people who um, I just love the work that they do. And this week's guest is Dr. Mahila Talakan. She is, um, she holds a degree in veterinary medicine and a master of science in uh, nutrition. She advanced her nutrition studies in functional and mind-body medicine through the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Dr. Telecon added to her knowledge coaching skills through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition by becoming a health coach. And she is also the author of the book, Make Peace with Fat, the founder of Healing with Foods, and she is um, the owner of her own wellness coaching practice. And something else that she's going to share with us today is she is the creator of something called the C-U-R-E, the Cure Method. So I'm really excited to dive in today to get back to a conversation around healing the physical body. For those of you that have been listening in for the past couple of weeks or months, we've been diving in a little bit more into some emotional healing and some spiritual healing. And for me, the body is where it all begins. It's the foundation. Nourishing the body is on an emotional level, what I like to call a um, basic form of self-love. And we do this through nourishing our body with healthy foods. And both Mahila and I have a passion for healing the gut, anti-inflammatory eating, and just really empowering people to learn how to create healthy habits and find out what can help them to heal their body so that they can become empowered to feel better with their energy and how they show up in their life. So super excited to share an expert in the area of healing the body through functional medicine and nutrition, Dr. Mahila Telecon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. What a wonderful introduction. I cannot agree more with everything you've said with regards to nourishing the body. It's a form of self-care and self-love and um, the body, the, this physical aspect of us as human beings is um, how and where we manifest what's happening in the rest of us emotionally and spiritually. So. Yes, they are all I couldn't important. Agree. I couldn't agree more. And I love that you said that. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on the show is because there are many people out there that can talk about health and nutrition and functional medicine. But you also have this training and this practice in, and value in also the healthy mindset. And just what you said, the body is the foundation and the place where we manifest everything outside of that, which I 100% agree. And it starts in the body. So Mahila and I met six years ago in a course. And if you're wondering, you might notice she has an accent. She grew up in Romania. So born and raised in Romania. And part of what you do in your practice that is so, um, that really sets you apart from other people is for you, this ancient wisdom and this ancestral way of eating is just part of what you were born into and it's something that was part of your culture and it's something that you share with others in your practice and it really just comes down to keeping it simple and whole food eating and so yes. i really just want to start by saying that because i think for the listeners nutrition is a very controversial topic and some people they get a little uncomfortable when they think about working with a health coach or a nutritionist because they think that it has to look a certain way. And one of the things that you and I both talk about and that you're, you do through your, your cooking channel, you have a cooking channel, which I'm going to ask you to share all of the resources at the end, is you show people how to just go back to the way that we used to survive and thrive. And so it's really kind of the undoing, especially in our culture in this country of the 
unhealthy habits that we've picked up and really just simplifying that through healing with whole foods, which is the name of your coaching practice. Yes. So um, I want to ask you, what are some of the, when you think about where you came from, because this is a very important part of who you are. It's something that it's one of your gifts that you share with people that you work with. When you think about growing up in Romania and eating whole foods, what are some of the things that really drive that inner passion for you to share with other people? Well, it's a good question. Um, growing up with little food, you learn that food is really fuel and nourishment, like you said. Um, it's not a reward, it's not celebration, it's not feeling emotions. It does have a social aspect, but it was primarily we were happy if we had something to eat. <laughs> and it was usually, like you said, whole food, locally grown or raised in season. So because I... It's almost like the wiring we have as, as we are formed. I see the opposite happening here now. I'm, I've been in United... Oops, sorry. I'm, are we still on? For some reason, I lost you. Uh-oh. Oh, hmm. Something happened. Okay. Hmm. <clears> hmm. <throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Aloha, friends, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Embodied Healing Self. So this week, I'm super excited to dive into topic around healing the physical body and really excited to share this week's guest with you, the beautiful Dr. Mahila Telekon, whom I met about six years ago. We also did a health telesummit together about a year ago. She holds a degree in veterinary medicine and a Master of Science in Nutrition. She advanced her nutrition studies in functional and mind-body medicine through the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Dr. Telecon added her knowledge and coaching skills through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition. She is the author of the book, Make Peace with Fat, the founder of Healing with Foods. She has a wellness co coaching practice and is the creator of the C-U-R-E, The Cure Method. She loves anything outdoors, the sun and the water, and she realizes that that is also a vital, vital part of our well-being. And I'm just super excited to share her with you today. So thank you so much for being on the show with me today. <laughs> thank you for having me. Super excited. Yeah. So Mahila and I both share a passion and a belief that Healing the body with healthy foods is the foundation for everything in life. We both hold true the belief that nourishment is a basic form of self-love. 
that when we properly nourish the body, whatever we, whatever we do to take care of our body also manifests in our outer world. And what I love about the work that she does and she shares is she really ties in the healthy mindset with whole food, healthy eating. She encourages and inspires people and shows them that it can be simple and just keeping it whole food eating and keeping a healthy mindset about it. So I'm really excited to share her today. She's really an expert in this area. She has gone above and beyond studying functional medicine, healing the gut. We're both passionate about anti-inflammatory eating and just really inspiring, but more importantly, empowering people. So really empowering people to learn to understand their bodies and what works for them with food so that they can have this quality of life that they desire. And we both believe that the foundation for that starts with the body. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I love it. Absolutely agree with you. The way I see us, the humans, we have an emotional body, we have a spirit or spiritual body, and we have a physical body. And the physical body is like a vessel, a gift that was given to us so we can experience life on earth. And if we cherish and we honor this vessel that allows us to enjoy and everything so much that we can enjoy on earth, like sun and water and sports and children and all that, um, it, we have it all. So my mantra or my quote, which I created and I'm proud of, is health is the currency of life. So if health was the currency of life, this is how I like to ask anyone that, you know, ask me, what do you do? What are you? How do you rate your health value? Are you going from paycheck to paycheck? Are you a 6K earner or you're a millionaire? Mm. And if whatever is your health worth, is it enough or you want more? <laughs> so, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. And so actually I was recently asked, um, I love that you said that I was recently asked to put health in one word and the word that came to me was abundance. And many people think of abundance as money or material things. And to me, it's just the receiving of nourishment and that receiving of nourishment comes in relationships. It comes in money. It comes in happiness. And like you, I agree that oftentimes our relationship with how we nourish ourselves and our relationship with our health show, says a lot about our relationships with other things too. And um, the body is the foundation. I couldn't agree more. And uh, I, I also know that, you know, as we continue, there's also an energetic component to the body that as we continue to nourish and increase our energy, the energy of our life, our relationships, everything just sort of elevates. matches. It elevates exactly. It matches that vibration. So, yeah. and I love that you share that message through your nutritional coaching as well. So super excited to share what you have to say today. And I want to start by sharing, uh, you probably notice her adorable accent. Mahila was born and raised in Romania. And I like to share that with you because, um, part of her, the programs that she creates and what she inspires other people to do is part of her innate wisdom that she learned growing up in the way that she ate with just a very ancestral primal way of eating. And she shares that in her, in her program. In fact, the name of her business is Healing with Whole Foods. So um, I want to just ask you, because now living in this country, you know, in, in the United States, like we have very different habits and patterns than when we travel around the world, right? And so I want to ask you, when you think of growing up as a child, what, what is it that really drives your passion for teaching people this simple way of being by connecting back to whole food eating and showing people 
that there is a more simple way to do it, that there is a healthy way to do it that isn't as complicated as people want to maybe think that it is. When you think about growing up as a child in Romania, because you bring that, that wisdom into your practice, what is it that makes you passionate about sharing that with people? I love to, like you say, to, to show people that it's not complicated to eat whole foods. Uh, yes, it requires thinking ahead and prepping, but it's not, it doesn't have to be elaborate meals. Um, and if I'm bringing something from my upbringing is uh, the value and the power of eating locally and seasonally. And um, fermenting and eating nose to tail, which is quite a popular term. I don't know if you, you probably uh, watch you, uh, YouTubers and podcasters that keep bringing this organ meat and bone marrow and meat and bones, bone stock, all of that. It sounds like new and trendy and difficult and impossible, but uh, that is how our grand grandparents ate. And that's, uh, I refer to that, like we can go 250 years back and that's traditional eating. When, again, our ancestors did not have any of the commodities of modern living. They didn't have microwaves. They didn't have pack, pre-packaged mixed things that you just put together and it turns into a meal. Um, so they pass from generation to generation uh, methods of cooking that were not only good for the body, but also... Um, made it in a way, again, live in harmony with the earth, with, okay, is, this is the harvest time. We can ferment and store so we have for winter when there's nothing fresh coming out of the earth. So I feel like we are losing that, although it's coming back, which is it's a, it's an exciting thing. Um, so that's traditional wisdom. And then I'm... I don't know where this comes from, but I'm always going even further back in time to ancestral. So if we think at our body, like we, we said already before, is this vessel that allows us to, to experience life on earth. And if we think that it, it has a design, an intelligent design behind it, the body was not designed to, like if we an, analyze the body, it was not designed to, to live in a climate-controlled environments. Again, to get easy, convenient foods, to hide away from the sun. So if we were to look at our biology and physiology, we see that we shiver when it's cold, so we generate heat, so we don't freeze to death, right? We sweat when it's hot, so we cool our body off so we don't burn <laughs> away and die. Um, we, of course, we are thirsty when, when uh, we need to drink. Uh, we get hungry when it's time to refeed. Uh, when we go in the sun, we get tan, so we protect against sun burning. So the body is so miraculously designed or it evolved at, you know, different schools of thought. It's, 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 made to support us in probably unfriendly environments. Mm -hmm. So our biology remained the same. Our environment is very friendly. We have drive-throughs, we have packaged foods, we have microwaves, we have suntan, we have AC, we have heating. <laughs> so our, this fabulous biological machine doesn't get to operate to its standards. Mm -hmm. And that comes actually at a, a health cost. Mm -hmm. Because when we have all this comfort, which, yeah, and, I mean, I like the AC, but at the same time, I do challenge my body 
and take it out in the heat to sweat every day. Um, so what I'm trying to say is maybe we have to rethink how our biological body fits into our modern living. Because this, the biological body is perfectly designed and it has that inner wisdom, that ancestral wisdom built in. So, but the environment is not matching, it's not supporting. So therefore we end up eating when we are not hungry, eating the foods that are not in alignment with our biology, um, stay, hiding away from the sun. So therefore we develop vitamin D deficiency, not to say we don't get all the other health benefits that come from heliotherapy, like exposure to sun or being out in nature or putting our feet in, in dirt and grounding ourselves. I mean, uh, and my business is, and my, my passion is healing with foods, but it goes beyond. Food is one aspect of taking care of the physical body. And then we can expand to more and more. So I don't know if this answered your question. Yeah, yeah it, 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 and I love how you said that. I just want to sort of recap some of the things that you said. Um, I've never really actually heard it said that way before, and it, and it makes so much sense, really just thinking about, you know, our well, our bodies do learn to adapt to the environment, but at a cost. And so we can choose to um, sort of like that, that ancestral cellular memory of the body that was innately very resilient hundreds and thousands of years ago before any of these things were available for us to just live, you know, and, and have access to whatever we wanted so quickly. Those things have, although they're convenient, have um, also allowed us to sort of forget the practice of nourishment and remembering that food every time that we nourish it's an opportunity to fuel our body and so to really being mindful to put the right things in our body and to eat consciously and as you share that i realize that there are many listeners on here who are going to have many different thoughts and many different choices around the way that they choose to eat and two of the most controversial, probably maybe the most controversial topic I find in nutrition is the one of protein and then of fat. And you and I have been down the road of figuring out because we do this type of work, you have even spent time being a vegan, you've done mostly raw food. And so you've allowed yourself to experience the many different options that there are. And I think what I want to say is that nutrition and, and holistic health in general is never a one size fits all. So whatever it is that we are sharing today, we are just sharing information and beliefs that we know to be true to work in our current lives and the people that we work with. And if you're listening on the show and the, you know, what is coming through and what we're sharing doesn't resonate with you, that's okay too. We're here to share a possibility of just reframing and rethinking your relationship with food. And I'd like to talk a little bit more specifically about protein and fat because you wrote the book, Make Peace with Fat. So that right there just shows that it is something that is very misunderstood in our culture. I mean, people think if they want to lose weight, they should go for the fat-free thing, the sugar-free thing, which is going to have chemicals in it. And the fat-free thing is not a whole food to begin with. So it's very controversial. And then the other topic that goes into alignment because both of these things are part of the are part of what do fuel us is the protein. So I want to just invite I just want to open the conversation with that and ask you what is what do you see in your practice when people come to you is something that people say to you that shows that they may not understand how to properly food combine or fuel their body with healthy proteins and fats. What do you see most people bring to you is one of the most common misunderstandings in that area? Great question. And I think because of hearing that over and over again, fat, are you serious? You're telling me that I can eat fat? 
I decided to write a book <laughs> called <laughs> Make Peace with Fat. We are like, and it's not only United States, pretty much all civilized, uh, industrialized world is fat phobic. We were taught, I learned in school, I remember doing diet education when I worked as a dietitian in hospital, telling my patients, you can eat um, chicken, take off the skin, trim off the visible fat. It was like a, a little mantra that, that would go to every patient. Uh, why? Because we were taught that fat, primarily saturated fat, those that come from animal food source and cholesterol are going to clog our arteries and give us heart attacks and diabetes and cancer uh, and are also promoted as inflammatory. So uh, that probably is the biggest fear most um, women that I work with come with, and despite the fact that they, they come already pretty educated when they come to me, they eat organic, they, they look more for whole foods, they read food labels to make sure they, they get, you know, foods that are packaged that are made with reasonable ingredients, but they still count calories hmm. and, and count fat. With regards to protein, most people, you would ask, they will be afraid of eating too much protein uh, and, and that somehow affects kidney health and leads to cancer, which here I am, I thought the same thing. Uh, hence, for my personal healing journey, I embraced for three years a raw vegan uh, lifestyle. And then when I realized that eating raw was just killing me, slowly mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I cooked my foods but I still continue to be vegan for I don't know maybe another three years and then four more years vegetarian so a total of 10 years I played with plant-based eating um, and again let's remember I'm coming from a traditional way of eating with sourdough bread we had bread I had gluten growing up very little refined, like no packaged food. Let's put it that I did not taste a soda until I was uh, 18 years old. And when I tasted, I spit it out and I said, I cannot believe people are drinking this. I, I said, this is not for human consumption. So that is to show that your taste buds, if, if, and that, that goes to our children because most of our, our listeners probably are moms with children. It's so important what we offered stimulate the taste buds with in terms of food because that that connection between your taste buds and your brain mm -hmm. it can hijack the brain in such a terrible way where you and or the kids will crave for sweet um will recognize as desirable and safe so it overrides the body foods that are not safe like soda me not being exposed to it when I tasted it, I was like, no way. <laughs> Is yeah. anybody drinking this for good? I, I couldn't find any pleasure in it. It was repulsive. So um, going back to that, that's the main, the, those are the main fears. Fat is dangerous, primarily animal fat and too much protein of, of, and of animal source, it will give me cancer. Yeah, I would agree. I hear that often. And even as we're sitting here talking, you and I still have different ways that we choose to eat. And what I want to say to that, I know what I've learned for me over my journey um, through learning about nutrition and whole food eating is that, and just to speak to how you shared your personal journey, um, I just want to sort of give permission to the listeners to really know that there is also this place that Mahila and I both understand that, that whatever is working for you right now, it might be different next year. We are in, you know, we are both in our forties. And so we are looking at um, keeping the hormones in balance, which fat plays, plays a role in that. And so, you know, it, if you're pregnant or nursing a baby, your needs are very different than they are when you're in your forties. If you're, if you're a child, 
you they're you know you need a lot more complex carbohydrates when you're a kid burning all that energy off than you know when you're someone our age so i think what we're what i want to just say to the listeners that what we are sharing is just information about our journey and how we learned to work how one thing can work for us at a certain time and um so i really thank you for sharing that i i I love to share that you were a raw vegan for three years. I actually myself tried the raw vegan thing and I was so out of like, I just couldn't even focus. I mean, I, I just couldn't, I was so, I was like very anxious and it wasn't, it just wasn't the right fit for me. And this was like, you know, in the beginning of my health journey, maybe 10 years ago. So mm-hmm. many listeners probably think and assume like, raw vegan, although it is wonderful. And both you and I will agree that yes, plant-based foods are a super important part of your diet, but raw vegan gets this um, sort of, um, you know, kind of, people always assume that I am raw vegan because I I do healthy food. They just assume it. And Mm. although you and I both have taught workshops, like how to make cashew cheese and, you know, things like that. And we love foods like that because we're, we're also integrating in healthy fats and proteins when we do that versus, you know, a dairy cheese as an alternative. Um, Many people automatically assume, I know for me at least that health is all about being raw eating raw and vegan. And what I want to say to that is there's just so much more to what makes each individual feel good than just the protein and the fat. But what we're here to share with you today is that fat and protein are such an important part of everyone's diet, no matter what choice you are choosing, because it's energy and it's fuel. And I love how you shared, um, just the parenting piece, because for any listeners out here who happen to be young parents, I will tell you 100% that the, the younger you start, the easier your journey will be. My 13 year old has makes her own green juice, has no desire to eat sugary things because she knows that, you know, super, and, and this is at a middle school age where it's very popular and she's in, we just transitioned to public school and you know, it's kind of a social thing and it's cool to go out and have a milkshake and French fries and all these things. And she's just like, nope, that's going to make my skin break out. And that's not going to make me feel good. And, you know, she might allow herself to have like a couple of something, but then she'll like come home and make a green juice. So there's a social, I say that to say that um, the journey of parenting and teaching your kids to eat healthy is, is also a whole nother journey that is really helpful to have support in because, um, you know, just there's a social component to it too, but the sooner you start and build that family, the easier easier it is because my kids, I remember at a young age would not even, they wouldn't even eat a boxed granola bar. They were like, that doesn't taste good because I made my own granola bar. So they had this acquired taste for what a granola bar should taste like and the boxed ones, even the healthy ones didn't taste good. Not the same. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing um, about the the fat and the uh, protein. And tell me a little bit about those listeners who are still like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super convinced. I still don't know about the, the fat and the protein thing. If they're interested in reading your book, this is a way they can find out more. Tell me a little bit more about what your book shares with people to educate them on, you know, the, uh, the whole idea of particularly healthy fats. Yes. So the book, although it's called Make Peace with Fat, is actually much broader, much more comprehensive. It has three sections. One section is the awareness part. I am a firm believer that once we become aware, like you become aware that certain fats are good for you, Certain fats are not, like vegetable oils, for example. And protein is not only safe, but is desirable to nourish your body. And you become aware that, yeah, carbohydrates are actually the problem. And we can get a little bit into explaining how uh, all this makes sense. Now you have a choice. Once you are aware of something, you can choose how you use that 
new acquired information. So that's the first part of the book where I, I bring raise awareness with regards to this. And I have a knowledge section, which is pretty intense, but is, is broken down so a lay person can understand it as well as a person that has uh, more studies in nutrition or in medicine will understand as well. And I explain what are carbohydrates, the types, the food sources, then the fats, then the protein. I talk about fasting. So that's pretty. And I, I look at the book as a reference where you read, you empower, so you become aware of what is, how the body functions. What are these carbohydrates, protein, and fats? How do they translate in food? And then you have a, a, another section on taking action, setting menu. Because these things you have to refresh. It's, it's actually a lot of learning. The book makes you unlearn what you learned previewed through the new lens and just oppose that to your body's needs and response to what you're trying. Does this make sense? Yes, it does. So for my listeners, in summary, can you give us a few words about um, what a fat a protein and a carbohydrate are and what they do for the body. Super, yes. So fat, carbohydrates, and proteins are known as macronutrients. The foods we eat, they come with macronutrients and micronutrients. Micro, small amounts, vitamins, minerals. Macro, larger amounts, carbohydrates, protein, and fats. Carbohydrates, protein, and fats, they also have an assigned energetic value or caloric value. So when we eat food, we get nutrients and we get energy. The energy that comes from food is not as relevant to your health as is the metabolic effect of the foods mm. and I'll try to explain this so it's not confusing so looking at the food as oh how many calories am I getting from this meal it's rather superficial and incomplete because what matters more is how those calories interact with the hormones that regulate energy balance so for instance, carbohydrates and proteins, if we were to look at the calories, they are equal in terms of assigned caloric value, four calories per gram. But what happens when you eat, let's say 100 grams of um, sugar versus 100 grams of chicken, or maybe instead of saying sugar, we can say- Bread. Orange, bread, good. Yeah. <laughs> so 100 grams of bread versus 100 grams of chicken, they both have 400 calories, right? But what happens hormonally in the body is two different responses. And now we bring, and I'll, then I'll explain the response. We bring the third macronutrient fat, which is almost double in terms of energy. It has nine calories per gram. Let's say butter. So if we take grams of butter, completely different metabolic response or energy exchange response than the other two have. So the 400 calories of bread will absorb in your gut, mainly in the form of glucose. And in order for our body to utilize that glucose as source of energy, the body will respond with one of the metabolic hormones called insulin. When insulin spikes in the bloodstream, the body gets the message there is food, there is plenty, thinking ancestral, there is plenty, there is abundance, let's store fat. When you eat the protein, it has about half of the response or, or stimulation of insulin of that of carbohydrate. So you'll get a, maybe a bump in insulin, but not nearly as severe 
of a message of let's store fat. When you eat the fat, although it's 900 calories, the body doesn't get any message in terms of let's store anything. It registers like nothing is coming in hormonally. So mm -hmm. you continue to break fat as fuel. So now let's say you are in need to lose weight. If you eat 400 calories of bread, you tell your body, stop burning fat because I have plenty. Let's save some more. Versus if you do the 900 calories of fat, your body is like, nothing is coming. Let's burn fat. Mm -hmm. Now, where do calories make sense in here? If those 900 calories are more than what you need, you will burn fat, but you will mainly burn the fat you're eating. Right. If your goal is to lose your own fat, then you will eat a little bit less fat. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So, so the messaging, if, if now if you put in, in alignment the message that comes from the, the hormonal response of food with the energetic value, if they both tell your body, nothing comes in less burn fat then you begin to learn to burn your own fat and lose body fat mm -hmm. not muscle mass so that's kind of the, the interaction it's it's quite interesting to see that um if we look at food as calories is really misleading and yes. counting calories and restricting calories putting that the body in that mild starvation is like holding your breath. Yes. How long can you hold your breath for? Yes. Very little. So yeah, you can do some crazy diet for a week, for a month, even for three months. But the problem is you still haven't changed your default eating. Mm -hmm. So once you are <gasps> ready to breathe again after the diet, symbolically speaking yeah you go back to what you've done before <laughs> and you your body's like oh finally i'm getting something and then the weight comes back on the inflammation comes full swing and so on and so forth you you don't you never find yourself in a place of freedom i eat to nourish my body to get the energy it needs I'm healthy. I can do other things. You're always thinking, oh my gosh, I just lost 30 pounds and I gained 50 back and my joints are aching and my doctor tells me I have prediabetes and cancer runs in my family. And so you're always stressed mm -hmm. and overwhelmed about something that should be as effortless as breathing. Yeah. Yes. And I... That's why it's so important to have guidance because there, it is, it's so easy to want to do this on your own and look some things up on the internet and read all the different trendy diets and all the different, you know, supplements or all these things that, you know, do a protein shake instead of just having a, an, an actual like fully nourishing meal, right? Because that seems easier to some people, but... Um, like you, I agree. Like it all starts with that wholesome meal and I, the body really does have this innate wisdom. And as I hear you speak, I'm thinking like, well, like the body's going to just burn the carbohydrate, the sugar first, cause it's easier to do. Yes, right. Absolutely. So of course, like that's just kind of the natural process. Our bodies are really resilient. They're going to do what's easier first. And so there is this this opportunity to really also listen to your body. If you know that you feel low energy, if you feel deprived, if you're experiencing hormonal swings, because this is sort of the age, you know, the women, if you're working with women right now, predominantly forties and fifties, we get into this mm -hmm. swing of wanting to balance the hormones. And ladies, I'm going to tell you, this is a super important part of maintaining that hormonal balance, not just doing the work to heal the gut with the fermented foods and the, you know, cleaning it out first, but then also making sure that you have those 
complete meals. So what I want to ask you is to give our listeners an example of what is a complete healthy meal that if the listeners could just start with like one type of meal with this a day to prevent that pendulum swing of, um, you know, doing a diet and starving and then gaining even more weight back because, and something else I noticed is um, over the years, and you probably noticed this too, is often people with diets low in protein crave sugar because they're craving energy. They're just craving energy. If you're, if you're not eating, eating enough fats or proteins, what can happen is usually what I see as a habit is these are the people that are craving sugar and mm -hmm. you know those carbohydrates in the bread because it gives them that instant energy. So what is an example so, of like a complete meal, just very simply for the listeners? Uh, super, uh, super simple. It, I would have to say it depends what the goal of the person is. Uh, uh, I will tell you what I do and um, with the, the women I work, most of them want to have more energy, want to have sustained energy, not to crash throughout the day and uh, to shed some excess body fat. So in this case, um, you want to optimize your body's ability to burn fat as fuel. Because you said something, people crave more if they don't have enough fat and protein. And it's true. Glucose is one of the fuels that the body uses, but it's not the only fuel. And that's, again, unlearning. We learn, oh, glucose, you cannot live without uh, eating carbohydrates. So maybe I should say carbohydrates as a food group are uh, found in plant foods. Yes. And, um, and they, they are uh, of different nature. But the one that absorbs and gives us energy, the common one is glucose. And glucose isn't starch. Starch is nothing but many molecules of glucose together. So when that's broken down, it's absorbed in the bloodstream as glucose. So what's starch? Grains, bread, baked goods, sweet potato, white potato, corn, peas, uh, legumes will have starch. So all these foods have glucose ultimately. Um, then you have double sugar, like in milk, lactose, glucose, galactose, again, glucose. Uh, then you have sugar, glucose and fructose, the sucrose, the, the table sugar. And we have sugar in fruits, which is another one. Most people are like, what? You mean, I can't eat fruits? Well, it depends what's your goal. It's not like you can't. You can't do anything you choose to do. Right. But what's your goal? <laughs> if you right. want to have that energy and if you want to burn your own fat, you may for a while reconsider fruits, reconsider or oh, grains. I would reconsider for, for life pretty much. Grains are, are not uh, optimal food for humans. But going back to that meal. So if you want to burn, uh, if you want to have sustained energy, you want to change the primary fuel your body is using. Your body will always use glucose for the, or the cells of the body that require glucose. But there is fat that is available food for the body. And it can be used by all cells of the body except this, the brain, the computer, the one that will make you feel hungry or hangry and <laughs> shaky and sweaty and like you want to kill someone because you're that hungry the drops mm -hmm. but the brain can also use ketone bodies so we're getting a little bit technical mm -hmm. here but it's important for the listeners to understand and that's what the book explains in, in great detail so you can use three fuels basically that's what the body uses glucose fatty acids and ketone bodies ketone bodies are the byproduct of burning fat Mm, yeah. I like mm. to use an analogy that really brings the point home, and I don't know how we are doing with time, is the fire analogy. So if we are making a fire and we want to warm up a house and cook with that fire, and we have hay available, we have wood logs, and we have coal, what are we going to use to keep the fire going, to give us enough heat to cook and keep the house warm? 
I'll ask you now since I don't have anybody else to ask. We have hay, hay wood. wood, and coal. So what do we use to keep the fire going? The wood. The wood. And the wood burns into coal, right? Mm -hmm. Why don't we use hay? Well, it burns quickly. Quickly. So hay is glucose. Mm -hmm. Wood is fatty acids. Coal is ketone bodies. Mm. You have all of them. It's up to you what you choose to use. If you go and choose hay or glucose, you're going to be hungry every two to three hours. You're going to yeah. have mood swings. You're going to have energy crashes. You're going to sleep with your head on your desk. You're not going <laughs> to be able to, to burn your own fat yeah. to, to, main, to, to reach a, a body weight that uh, you desire. And the most important is the energy aspect. And in Client after client after client, once we, we put the body in that fat burning mode, they're like, I can't believe I have all this energy. From yes. Seven in the morning until nine o'clock at night, I'm like, boom, 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 getting that. And then I just want to rest. And that's what you want. When it's yes. time to sleep, your body to tell you, oh, go lie down. But as you go throughout the day, you, you don't want that, right? You want to have the energy. So you do things, mental and physical. Yes. And you get that when you burn fat, not glucose. When you, ba you burn mm -hmm. wood and coal, not hay. Hay, you have to be there to put it all the time because it burns too fast. Yep. And I love that picture that you painted for us with fire. It made it much easier to understand for my understand. listeners that are visual. Um, and really just to so kind the of... Meal. The meal. The meal. Yeah. <laughs> just, what, just, just, an meal. Example, just an so example. Just an example of, of like... A meal. So if we understand that we want to stay away from external sources of glucose because our body already can produce its own glucose. We will make our plant food sources, those that do not come with sugar or starch, lactose, if, if we want to do, talk about dairy, right? So that means we're going to eat plants that grow above the, the ground and mm -hmm. do not have starch. It's a variety of greens uh, and garden vegetables. It's, it's quite a, a generous amount of plants. Lots of so choices, yeah. Lots of choices. So those would be your source of the macronutrient carbohydrate. Cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, cucumber, zucchini, mushrooms, okra, yada, 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 all the greens. Mm -hmm. that's all carbohydrate does not spike insulin therefore you let your body burn fat yeah. some fat that comes in the plate some fat that's on your body so that's the the vegetables then you have a good source of protein best absorbable source of protein for humans is of animal source and if you think we are like the this biological machinery is um of its animal biological machinery is not a plant. So the, the way to replenish muscles and, and to make hormones and enzymes and to grow healthy, shiny hair and nails and all that is to give our body the amino acids that resonate more with our body and that's of animal tissue. So you will have a piece of fish, you would have chicken, you have pork, you have beef, you have lamb, you have duck. It doesn't matter the, the animal uh, protein, it's of your choice, plenty of options. And then fat that comes with it. So when we say make this with fat, we're talking about the fats that come, like we talk of whole foods, come with the food, the skin that's on the duck, the skin that's on the fish, the marble fat that comes with the muscle meat or with the, uh, the, the fat that comes with the liver or other organ meats that you would consume. And you would stay away from industrialized fats. So this is what I like, I'm passionate about the ancestral eating and living. And just think our ancestors, when was no industry, so I'm not even talking traditional. Traditionally, they had olive oil, okay? Mm -hmm. That's 250 years back, maybe, I don't know, a thousand since agriculture, we have olive oil. Traditionally, they had just the fat that came with the foods mm -hmm. they ate. Modernly, 
we hear and we go in the supermarket and we see aisles of colorless, odorless, tasteless, vegetable, <laughs> industrialized, chemicalized oils. They don't belong to this machinery. Again, our environment and the biological machinery. We have to question what we put in our body. And always trying to go back and think how our ancestors eat. That's where the simplicity in eating comes. We don't need mm-hmm. ketchup and sauces and all this. Yeah, food industry wants to make money, of course. But does this need that? Yeah. So to the fats, they will come with the food you eat. If you cook, you can safely use butter or ghee. If, you're, if uh, the listeners have uh, dairy sensitivities mm-hmm. they can try ghee or any fat that comes from roasting meats duck fat chicken fat pork fat all that i know it sounds like what saturated fat cholesterol if you eliminate the glucose containing foods and you don't spike that insulin fat is your friend I think that's an important, Again. what you just said. Yeah, <laughs> what you said is really important because because what I notice is that people want to hear what works for them. And so they want to be like, oh, I have permission to eat all my meat now. But no, eating the hamburger with the hamburger bun. Without and, the bun. And no, and but no you know, French fries. The tra- exactly, the traditional <laughs> American no. meal. And let's just think about the summer barbecue, like add in watermelon, which is fermenting all that food and you're God, it's such a horrible combination. So what's really important, what I want to say is it's super important. What, what I want the listeners to hear is like the example that she's giving you, she noticed that she is very clear about what you're eating together because that is really important. I think you froze for a second. Because the effect of insulin is long. Oh, you lost me? No, you're there. I got you. So, yes. Yeah, so... It's, it's not bread and butter, it's broccoli and butter. It's not French fries next to your uh, burger uh, and bun under the burger patty. It's maybe lettuce under the burger patty or tomato and um, guacamole next mm-hmm. to it instead of French fries. So it's, yes. this is super important to understand because when you put the fat with the carbohydrate, with the glucose together, it's like the perfect inflammatory bomb. Yep. <laughs> and that's when you start to gain the weight. That's when you start and to, to drive inflammation. Yes. Yes. So thank you for all of the clarity around that. There were a couple of key takeaway points, I think, for the listeners today. And if you have questions on, um, if you're curious about learning to eat this particular way, because I, because actually in my house we eat a, we eat differently than this. I, this is a huge area of discomfort for me. This is a huge edge growth for many people in our culture to, because we, we are in a culture where we waste so much. We waste so much. And I've traveled enough. I've been to 35 countries. I know when I go, I'm just like, oh my gosh. Like, yeah, if you, you know, we went to the Bahamas at, um, in March and we stayed, like they had their own island. And so they made fish soup and they ate every single part of the soup. And it was just like, wow, we don't really do that where we live, right? Like we get the filet and we're missing Mm -hmm. all of the nutrients. So, um, you know, if, if you're a person who is, um, really struggling with energy levels or hormonal balance and curious about, you know, that your body feels good when you eat protein, then Mahila is a wonderful resource. And I know she has a cooking channel. And we didn't even get to talk about the cure method. Um, I just want to ask you what it stands for and what it is before we go, because I know we only have a few more minutes. Um, But I'm just so grateful that you came on the show to demystify all of these beliefs around fat and protein that, you know, I'm still navigating through because I became a vegetarian at the age of 14. So, um, you know, it's just, and I think everybody's on their own journey, but wherever there are listeners here who are like, yeah, I know it feels good when I eat a certain way that you are a person, you're a resource to show people how to uh, really optimize their energy by properly food combining and helping them to understand healthy ways to consume protein and to consume fat. And you also have the knowledge to help them to navigate their beliefs 
their beliefs around what they've been taught around animal protein. And um, this is very controversial for the listeners. This, there are different beliefs everywhere. And so Mahila is just sharing what she knows to be true, what she has learned from her ancestral wisdom, what works for her and her clients. And I'm super grateful that you came on the show to share all of that. So before we go, what is the cure method? So the cure stands for C in cure stands for connect, connect to the inner body's wisdom, the one that we have from millions of years and we lose because of the modern living. Yes. That's number one. And connect to your why. Why would you even want to connect to body wisdom? Why would you want to lose weight? So that's C in, in cure. U stands for unlearn. We have a lot to unlearn so we can free ourselves mm-hmm. to connect, to experiment and connect and receive. It's, it's like a, a, a two-way conversation that goes between the body and what we do for the body. Mm-hmm. Um, R in cure stands for redefine. Redefine food and redefine normal. Because for someone, for instance, for you, uh, still probably you eat quinoa Mm -hmm. and you do well with it. For me, I redefine grains are not food. Mm -hmm. If you are able to redefine what food is for you from a place of connection with your body, not because it says in the latest paper, not because it's the trendiest, no. Redefine out of a connect state you will not suffer. You will not feel deprived. You will not have to use willpower when you make your food choices. It becomes as easy and natural as breathing. And that's Mm -hmm. my vision for anyone I work with. If I can help them reach a point where just like effortlessly they breathe to meet a body's need for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, they will eat without having to spend mental energy and focus. It's just natural, by default. They gravitate towards the foods that serve their body. I've done my work. Mm -hmm. And then E in cure stands for elevate. With each one of these, as you go through your own cure, you elevate your life experience to the next level. Someone may elevate from eating packaged foods to only whole foods. Someone may elevate from buying from the supermarket to the farmer's market. Someone elevates from not walking to walking. I mean, elevation is from where you are to the next and to the next and to the next. And it's your own process. Your cure is what works for you. And my cure is what works for me. And I use this methodology with my clients to help them, to empower them to, to pause, to listen to the body to give enough time to, to yes. respond. For instance, you, you picked up quickly that uh, raw vegan wasn't, well, for me, mm-hmm. it took me three years. Mm-hmm. At first, I felt good because yes, I was cleansing from something, like all the grains, all yeah. the added sugar. So yes, I felt good in some regard. But in the end, it, it, so, so we always have to, that's why we have to connect to the body and honor the body's um, feedback. Don't yes. push it to the side. Don't go to the latest researcher. Yes. I don't, I'm not putting down science. Science comes to prove what the, the human body already, already knows. Has. Exactly. The body wisdom. I like to call it body wisdom. Body wisdom. Um, You know, so I often get asked the question and I just want to, I I also want to give you a chance to share where people can find you. But um, I do hear the question a lot, like what's the, because I'm not a registered dietitian, I'm a health coach. And so what I hear you saying is you've done both. You studied nutrition, you were a registered dietitian or nutritionist and also a health coach. And what I just heard you say is this is what a coach does that's different is a coach is somebody who really um, empowers you to learn about you. So a coach is somebody who has the information and the tools and the guidance to support you on a path of moving you towards what works best for you. And normally, typically, and you've done both, so you can kind of tell me what you think about this, but usually 
when you go to, or my experience with it, and believe me, I love all practices, dietitian, nutritionist, time and place for everyone and everything. Yeah. But if you're wondering yeah. what the difference is, my experience with the dietitian or nutritionist is you're going in for a specific set of symptoms that you're experiencing and they're going to give you a specific type way to Diet eat. Diet instruction. You, uh, yeah, structure of what to eat for the, your particular symptoms. Whereas a coach is somebody, what I hear you saying is you really integrate that empowering somebody through that cure method to connect with their own body wisdom because that that is really sustainable because yes. then they have the wisdom to guide them throughout their life yes. so that whenever your body does change you know because you learned how to listen to your body how to connect Mm -hmm. Oh, to unlearn. Maybe you're unlearning what used to work for you. Even, exactly. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you could Absolutely. be unlearning that, you know, raw vegan worked for like two years and maybe now it doesn't. Yeah. Like I, I, I say this to the listeners because as you and I are talking, we've been through many of these pathways through mm -hmm. a variety of ways to eat and there's no judgment or expectation in yeah. us. What a coach does is really want you to figure out what works best for you. And I love that you have, you've created this cure method. So thank you so much for sharing that. Where can my listeners find you? Best place is Facebook, both my personal profile and my healing with foods page, as well as Instagram. Those are my most active. I post uh, pretty regularly on YouTube too. And I have a website, of course, healingwithfoods.org. Um, but the, the, it's like farm to table, you know, you get the farm food from the farm, you take food to the table. Same with me. I'm here. I'm straight on, on Facebook. <laughs> so you don't yeah. have to go through loops and hoops. So that's, that's the best place to find me. And uh, regarding the, the cooking channel, I have a school of cooking, uh, that, uh, basically teaches people how to make traditional meals, ferments. Uh, organ meats, meat and bone stock, grain-free baking, since grains are, in my definition of food, not human food. Yeah. So I, I help people that want to go, go away from grains and sugar. Uh, and then I have other miscellaneous in there, but those are the three core uh, things. So for anyone that wants to, to learn how to do an anti-inflammatory gut healing cooking, that's what I teach in there. Awesome. I love it. And I know people who have been a part of that and they've absolutely loved it and they've learned so much. Yeah. And I just want to say for my listeners, grain free does it, what that can look like is it can mean that you can enjoy something that is made from almond flour or walnut yes. flour or cashew flour. Yeah. So I just want to say that because some people might be thinking, well, I can never eat What's that? Right, bread again or no, yeah. you get to yeah. enjoy it, but it, it, it has the healthy fats and the proteins in it. Yeah. It's yeah. You, you have and they're yummy. And they are <laughs> they're so yummy. good. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. I yes. know I many, many years ago participated in one of your uh, live webinars and you were making... Uh, we did the sauerkraut. You did a sauerkraut one, but sauerkraut? I also did an almond bread almond or something. Waffle? Something ah, like that. And, so, okay. and we've been... Um, gluten liberated for 10 years we haven't we don't eat gluten in our house gluten. it just doesn't it's not a good fit for us so um it's another way to just get your energy from yeah. foods so thank you so much for joining thank us you. i'm gonna share all of your social media links in the show notes and um let you know where you can find her and her book thank you so much for being thank you show. i appreciate it was a pleasure have a wonderful day same